Well, there were two priests one day, and they were having a conversation, and one of the priests said to the other priest, he said, you know, um, my bike recently got stolen, and I think it was someone in my congregation that stole it. And the other priest said, well, here's what you need to do. He said, read the Ten Commandments on Sunday, and then have the church read out loud the Ten Commandments, and hopefully the thief will get convicted, and he will come forward. And so the priest thought that was a good idea, and so following Sunday, he read the Ten Commandments, and he had the congregation read the Ten Commandments. Well, the next week, they got together again, and the priest said, so what happened? He said, well, I got good news. He said, uh, he says, I got my bike back. He said, so the Ten Commandments worked. The priest said, yeah, they absolutely did. He said, when I was reading them, and I came to thou shalt not commit adultery, he says, I remember where I parked my bike. We're looking at the Ten Commandments tonight, so turn, if you will, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This is part two on the Ten Commandments. Now, most of you have heard of Ted Koppel. Ted Koppel was giving a commencement speech at the University of Duke. And surprisingly, you know what Ted Koppel said? He said, the Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. And this is coming from someone who may not be a born-again Christian, but he understood that these are not the Ten Suggestions, but they are the Ten Commandments. Now, you have to understand, as you look at the Ten Commandments, God has universally given two laws to mankind. The first is what I would call the internal law, the internal law. This would be our conscience. God has stamped upon every single human being a conscience whereby they instinctively know right from wrong and basically, they know the Ten Commandments intuitively. Paul mentions this in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Indeed, when Gentiles, and they would be the ones that didn't have the law, who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirement of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and other times defending them. And so people instinctively have the law of God written on their hearts. They know the Ten Commandments. And what the conscience does is it serves as an arbitrator and either accuses them or defends them. But there's a second type of law that God has given mankind. Not everyone has access to this one. And this would be the external law. And this would be the Ten Commandments. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul says, now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved, here it is, on letters on stone. And so here Paul is introducing to us not the internal law, but he's introducing to us the external law, and not everyone has access to this particular law. Now, everyone has access to the internal law that God has placed in their hearts through their conscience, but not everyone has the privilege of knowing the Bible or the Ten Commandments, and that's what we're looking at this evening in our study. Now, you have to understand the Ten Commandments God uses, particularly in our country and other countries as well that has been exposed to Christianity, He uses the Ten Commandments to restrain sin and to reveal sin. It does have a, a moral use. Whether people follow the Ten Commandments or not, there is a sense in which the Ten Commandments reveal people's sin, and God uses it also to restrain sin within our culture. And really, what people do is they suppress the truth of the knowledge of God. That's what Romans chapter 1 says. Not only do people suppress the internal law of God, that God has stamped on people's hearts, but Romans chapter 1 says that people also do not want to follow the external law, which is the Ten Commandments. And I think we all know in our society today that we are rushing headlong against following the internal law of God and the external law of God. And that's why in our culture today, we see moral relativism running amok because people don't care about the law of God. Now, obviously, there's still a semblance of the law of God, or we would have total chaos and to total 
moral degradation in our society, but more and more, our society is suppressing the law of God. We also have to realize that the Ten Commandments actually prove the existence of God. Whether you're talking about the internal law written on your heart or the external law in the Ten Commandments, it actually proves the existence of God. You say, how so? Well, if you and I know right from wrong and there's a moral law, then there had to be a moral law giver. For example, in our government, we have three branches. One of them, as you know, is the legislative branch. They are the ones that make up laws. You would never say that the laws that govern our land came out of nowhere, would you? Well, it's the same with the law of God. You and I know right from wrong, and so the question is, where did that standard of right and wrong come from? Now, what atheists and evolutionists want to say, well, it's just part of society. There's really no moral objective standard, and the Bible makes it very clear that there is a moral objective standard, because if there is not an objective standard, then it's your preference versus my preference. If there is no meta-narrative that governs all of us, If there is no objective moral law that governs all of humanity, then it's your preference versus my preference. You like chocolate, I like vanilla. You cannot say what Adolf Hitler did was wrong. That's just your opinion if there is no objective moral law. And so these laws that govern society, and listen, even non-believers know certain things are wrong. Where did they get that instinctive knowledge? They got it from God. And so the moral law goes back to the fact that there is a moral law giver. And you see, the Ten Commandments are to be used by us when we do evangelism. Many times when we share the moral law of God, what it does, like a mirror, is it reveals sin. This came home to me this past week. I was having an internet conversation with someone, and here is what this person posted on their feed. They said, quote, I don't read the Bible that much, and I don't go to church, but I do obey the Ten Commandments religiously. And so here is how I responded to the person, quote, you sound like an honest and sincere person. However, according to the Bible, you must obey them perfectly to be saved from eternal hell. The problem is none of us can, and this is why we need a Savior to forgive us of our sin. And so the moral law of God, particularly in the Ten Commandments, is a way that you and I help people to see that they're sinners in need of a Savior. Because when I go to the hospital every Tuesday, it happened to me this week, I asked a particular woman, what do you think you got to do to get to heaven? She said, keep the commandments. Most people feel like if they keep the commandments, they'll get to heaven. And so I went through the commandments with her and showed her graciously that she has violated most of the commandments. And see, what happens is, as it says in the book of Nahum, the guilty will not go unpunished. In other words, God has to punish all violators of his law, and that's where Jesus Christ comes in. And so the Ten Commandments, again, not only restrains sin, but the Ten Commandments helps reveal sin so that people see their need for a Savior. In fact, too often today we say, well, you need to be saved, and a lot of people say, save from what? Save from what? If people don't see their need, they're not going to want a Savior because they don't know that they are sinners. Now, let's look at these commandments. They were received, as you know, at Mount Sinai. You'll notice the map up on the screen. If you remember, Israel was delivered out of Egypt right here. They traveled. They crossed the Red Sea here. Now they're camped at Mount Sinai. This journey right here was about a three-month journey. They're camped here for about a year, and Moses ends up going up to the mountain of Mount Sinai, and he gets the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. Now, where are they ultimately headed? Well, You'll see here, after a year, they're going to head up here, and they're going to end up wandering in the wilderness here for 40 years, and then eventually they're going to make their way up to the promised land. And so God is giving them the Ten Commandments here for the variety of reasons, which I won't review, that we looked at last time. Now, if you remember, the first four commandments deal with our relationship to God, and the last six deal with our relationship to one another. And Jesus summed up all the commandments in the Bible with two, love God and love other people. Now remember, the commandments are a reflection of 
the character of God. These are not just external to God. These represent who God is. And so the commandments reveal God's sovereignty. The commandments reveal his jealousy, his justice, his holiness, his honor, his faithfulness, his providence, his truthfulness, and his love. So let's pick up in verse 1. I'm going to review the ones we looked at last week very briefly, and then we'll pick up the remainder for this evening. He says in verse 1 of chapter 20, then God spoke all these words. Interestingly, the word words there in the Hebrew refer to the Mosaic covenant stipulations. It's a very specific Hebrew word, and it refers to the stipulations that God is about to give Israel. You say, what are the stipulations? The Ten Commandments. And notice the Ten Commandments are part of the Mosaic Covenant. Why is it called the Mosaic Covenant? Because God gave the commandments to Moses, and the people agreed that they would obey them. And God said, if you obey them, I will bless you. If you don't obey them, I will curse you. That is the Mosaic Covenant. Remember, God works through covenants in the Bible. He made a covenant with Adam and Eve. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham. He's making a covenant with Noah to the people of Israel. He's going to make a covenant with David. And you and I now are in the new covenant. And so it says here that God spoke all of these words saying, I am the Lord your God. And he uses the word God there, Yahweh. Yahweh is God's covenant keeping mechanism who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What God is saying there is, I have the authority to tell you what to do because I am the one who brought you out of slavery. This is what I have done for you, therefore this is how you are to respond. In other words, what he's saying is this, redemption requires responsibility. Because I've redeemed you, here is your responsibility. Because I have delivered you, here is your duty. And then God lists the commandments. The first commandment we looked at last week in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, God doesn't want you dating other gods. You know when you go out with somebody and you're kind of getting to know each other and you know, it's kind of awkward. You don't know where the relationship is going. And at some point, you have a conversation and you say, are we going to be exclusive? In other words, you're not going to see anybody else and I'm not going to see anybody else. Guess what God wants from you? He wants an exclusive relationship and he doesn't want you dating other gods. He says, I want you all to myself. That is the first commandment. That's the foundation from which all the other commandments are built. The second commandment, he says, do not make an idol to replace God. I'm paraphrasing it for shortness of time. If the first commandment is God wants to be the supreme one that you worship, God knows our tendency is to replace him with idols. How many of you watched American Idol years ago? Do you remember that show? It was one of the top rated programs. I remember we watched a number of seasons. And really the whole basis of the show is to basically narrow down the individual that America picks that is going to be America's what? Idol. Not necessarily that they worship that person, but this is the person that has the great voice and they have persona when they're on stage. Well, you know, we could take that phrase, American Idol, and we could talk about America's idols, because America is glutted with a lot of idols, and unfortunately, that has worked its way into the church, and the church today has replaced God with idols. You know, one of the biggest idols in the American church is materialism, comfort, and entertainment. That's what drives the American church. We have replaced God in our worship services with those particular things. The third commandment that we looked at last time was don't take God's name in vain. And there are two primary ways we do this, profanity and flippancy. I swear to God, we often use that phrase. You'll hear people say that all the time, and you see that's taking God's name in vain. And you know, a name represents who a person is. And so when we take God's name in vain, what we're doing is we're attacking the person of God because God's name represents who God is. And the Bible says rather than take his name in vain, we are to worship his name, we are to praise his name, and we are to exalt his name. The fourth commandment we looked at last time is keep the Sabbath. 
And that's the only commandment I noted for you that basically doesn't apply to today. That commandment was given to Israel. They were to rest one day out of the week, and they were to remember God's creative act. God created in six days. He rested on the seventh. And the reason why it doesn't carry over into the new covenant is because the Sabbath was a symbol and a picture of Jesus Christ. Just as the Passover pictured Jesus Christ and Jesus fulfilled the Passover, the Bible says Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. In what way? Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We don't celebrate the Sabbath one day a week. We celebrate it every day. Why? Because Hebrews 4 says, we trust in the finished work of Jesus, whereby we don't have to work for our salvation. That's why the Sabbath is no longer applicable for today. And then he gets to the fifth commandment, and this is where we pick up this evening, and this begins to deal with our relationship to others. Notice the first one, and that is this, we are to honor our father and mother. Notice what he says in verse 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, the word honor here has to do with one's attitude. The Bible says we're to obey our parents, especially when we're under their roof. But once you get out from under your parents, you're not necessarily required to obey them, but you are required to honor them. If you're living under their roof, you should honor, and Ephesians 6 says you should obey them. I remember when I was growing up, my mom would get on to me about that. I'm sure you heard it from your mother's lips at times. She would say to me, Michael, she says, you wouldn't talk to your friends the way you talk to me. You know what she was saying? You're not honoring me. And listen, we're not just to honor our parents when we're living at home, but the Bible says we're to honor them throughout our life. Listen to what Proverbs 23, 22 says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. In fact, it was a capital offense to curse your parents or to strike them with a blow. Exodus 21, verse 17 says this, anyone who curses their father or their mother is to be put to death. And exactly what our culture is doing is they're telling us to defy this command. Our culture, whether through books, whether through movies, or whether through the internet, they basically tell you to be subversive to your parents. And you know what this commandment implies? It implies the family unit whereby loving discipline is exercised. You see, when God says obey your father and mother, you know what that implies? There is a father and a mother in the house where there is loving discipline. And this is why Satan is launching an all-out attack upon the family, because if he can destroy the family, he can destroy society, and he's being very, very effective at it at this point. And so that's why God says here, we are to obey and respect our father and our mother. Now, there are two reasons why we are to give honor to our parents and we are to obey them if we are under their authority in their house. Number one, he says, it generates a longer life. Verse 12, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. In other words, he's telling Israel, when I take you into the promised land, if you want to live long and you want to have success in the promised land, obey your parents. Why? Because God knows that if parents pass down, listen carefully, moral truth to their children, they're going to pass it down to the next generation, and what you're going to have is a continuity of God's truth. On the other hand, if you break up the family and they're not taught biblical truth, what that does is it destroys a society, just like in the book of Judges. A generation grew up that did not know God. Why? Because there was dysfunction in Israel. He also says in Ephesians 6, if you want to live a long life in general, not just going to the promised land, but he says if you want to live a long life in general, as a general principle, obey your father and mother. Why? Because if they're teaching you the truth and you're staying away from evil, you're going to more than likely live a longer life. Now, this is not a guarantee saying that if you obey your parents, your life won't be cut short, but it's a general promise. And so the first reason why we need to honor our father and mother and obey them is because it generates a longer life. But there's a second reason, and that is this. Authority and submission is in God's created order. 
God has established authority and submission within his created order. For example, Jesus submits to God. Husbands are to submit to Christ. Wives are to submit to their husbands. Children are to submit to their parents. Employees are to submit to their employers. Citizens are to submit to the government. Angels submit to the Trinity. You see, God has established authority and submission within society. And you know what? What Satan wants to do is he wants to destroy that particular order. And he wants people to rebel against established structures. Now, the only time we're not to obey our father and mother is if they ask us to do something unbiblical. Should we still honor them? Absolutely, because they gave us life. But there are times where we may have to go against our father and mother because they ask us to defy the commandments of God. Well, there's the sixth commandment that he gives in verse 13, and it is this, you shall not murder. Now, some of you have the translation, not to kill, but actually a better translation is not to murder because there are times, which I will show you shortly, that killing is actually sanctioned by God. Now, what does he mean, do not murder? Well, he means do not take one's, someone's life in a premeditated fashion. Now, there is different types of murder or killing in the Bible. For example, we're going to see in chapter 21 in the weeks to come, there is involuntary manslaughter. And God actually made provision for that. If you killed somebody involuntarily, you could flee, according to Numbers 35, to a city of refuge. Because they didn't have police officers back then, and the family would want their revenge, and so you could go to a city of refuge. We're not talking about that murder here. We're talking about premeditated murder where you take someone's life, whether it be a preborn, a newborn, a child, an adult, an elderly person, or if you murder yourself. Now, God, why is God prohibiting thou shalt not murder? Because God considers human life sacred. If you read Genesis chapter 9, it was a capital offense if you committed premeditated murder. And the reason why God says in Genesis 9 is because we are made in the image of God and therefore God values life. And you and I know that murder is running amok in our culture because of all the violence that is going on. When I lived in Miami and I was planning a church, I would go in my neighborhood door to door and I would knock on doors and I would take a survey. And it was a way for me to invite people out to the church and also to share my faith. And when I knocked on this particular door, this gentleman came to the door. He was a pretty buff guy. He had a shaved head like me, and his son was next to him. And so I got to share the gospel with him and invite him to church. Well, months later, I was coming home, and I noticed my road was blocked off with that yellow tape. And I thought, what's going on here? And so I had to go around to get to my house. Well, I found out that was the exact house that I had witnessed to that guy to. He got in an argument with his wife. And he got so angry, he killed his son to get at his wife. Can you imagine doing something like that? That guy is going to spend the rest of his life in jail remembering that. God says, do not murder because you are striking a blow at the image of God. Now, let me tell you what this commandment does not apply to. Number one, it doesn't apply to just war. It doesn't apply to just war. Romans 13 says there are times where a country, in order for its national defense, it must engage in war. Nor does it include the killing of animals for food. Nor does this command, do not murder, include self-defense. Now, obviously, you want to defuse a situation, but if somebody is coming at you and they want to take your life, you have every right to defend yourself. And then finally, this commandment, thou shalt not murder, does not include the execution of criminals by capital punishment. I know this is debated today, but I believe the Bible does teach capital punishment. If you take someone's life, your life is required. Now, Jesus took this commandment and he went a little bit deeper because the Pharisees were all about the externals. Well, I haven't murdered anybody. And I would venture to say there's probably most of you here that haven't murdered anybody physically, but Jesus took it deeper when he talked about anger. Look what he said in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, 
that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Now, he's not saying if you lose your cool with somebody, you're going to hell. There is a form of judgment for people that have a lifestyle of anger. They're angry on the inside. They're bitter. And they manifest their anger towards other people. He says, again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, what that means is blockhead, stupid. He says, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You say, woo, I'm in trouble then because I've said that to people. Well, again, Jesus is using hyperbole here. He's not saying that if you call somebody a fool, the Proverbs calls certain people fools. He's talking about an attitude of the heart that is entrenched in a person's life. And listen, Christians can fall into this sin. They can fall into anger. We may not murder people physically, but we murder them with our words and we murder them with our anger. Well, then he goes to the seventh commandment in verse 14. He says, you shall not commit adultery. Now, we all know what adultery is. It's sex with someone outside of your marriage. And this is somewhat celebrated in our culture. And yet, to a certain degree, people in our culture know that this is not right. Remember when Tiger Woods was having all his affairs and other celebrities? People, even non-believers, kind of still frown, da- frown on this idea of committing adultery with somebody else. But this is becoming more popular in our culture. It's 20, 30 years. They have swingers clubs. This is very popular. In fact, one of my good friends, his wife was telling me when they were living in New York City, she was eating at this particular salad bar in New York, and this guy walked up to her and started talking to her, and he basically solicited her and said, well, you know, do you want to have a hookup? And she said, no. She says, I'm married, and I don't do that. He said, so what? So what if you're married, he said. He said, you need to catch up with the 21st century, is what he told her. And see, this is the mentality in our culture today. There is no standard in terms of thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, how do we violate this command? Well, there are a number of ways. Let me share them with you. Number one is emotionally. You may not have a physical affair with somebody, but you got to be careful you don't have an emotional affair. Now, it's technically not adultery in the definition here because adultery here, by definition, would be sexual intercourse. But if we're not careful, you can have an emotional affair with someone because your needs are not getting met in your marriage. And listen, just because you're married doesn't mean you're dead. It doesn't mean you don't find other people attractive, and it doesn't mean you don't connect with other people maybe better than your spouse but you are to set up guardrails. You're to have healthy friendships with the opposite sex, but you are to set up guardrails. Another way is physically, and obviously this is the one we understand, this would include intercourse or any type of touching. And then thirdly, there is relational adultery. What does that mean? This one is going to drive a little bit more home. When you divorce for unbiblical reasons and you remarry, you're committing adultery, Jesus said. In other words, if you divorce your spouse and you don't have biblical grounds for divorce and you remarry, Jesus says you're committing adultery, you and your new spouse. You say, ooh, I didn't know that. Well, here's the good news. You don't have to be a perpetual adulterer. If you leave your spouse and you run off with another person and you marry them, And at some point, you really have conviction and contrition, and you say, God, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. Guess what? God will forgive you. It's not the unpardonable sin. But you and I know we have adultery being proliferated all over this country. Why? Because people are divorcing for unbiblical reasons, like Bill Gates and his wife, or Jeff Bezos. We have irreconcilable differences, so we're going to divorce, we don't get along, and then they marry other people, and they proliferate adultery. And then finally, and we all are guilty of this one, there is mental adultery. If I asked how many of you here have ever committed mental adultery, how many of you raise your hands? Well, if you didn't raise your hand, you're violating one of the other commandments, thou shalt not lie. 
Matthew chapter 5, again, Jesus took that commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, and he says, if we look to lust after a person, we've committed the adultery in our hearts. And so these are four different ways that we can violate this commandment. So practically, how do we avoid from committing adultery if we're married? Let me give you a couple suggestions. Number one, keep boundaries with those you are attracted to or you connect with. Keep boundaries physically and emotionally. You don't need to act weird around people, but keep healthy boundaries. Number two, work at your marriage through communication, conflict resolution, and spending time together. You got to work at your marriage. If you're married, you understand this. Now, some couples have to work harder than others. Why? Because most people marry their opposite. And opposites initially attract and then they attack. That's what happens. It reminds me of the priest at his church, and he was doing a marriage seminar, and as he was talking, he called out a particular guy in the, in the seminar. His name was Giuseppe. And he said, Giuseppe, he says, uh, uh, you've been such a great example in your marriage. He says, you're getting ready to celebrate your 50th wedding anniversary. He said, come on up here and tell everybody the secret to your successful marriage. And so he got up in his Italian voice. He says, well, you know, I, I treated my wife great, and, and I did this. And then he said, and I took her to Italy for my 25th wedding anniversary. And the priest said, well, that's great. You're such a great example. He said, so tell me, what are you going to do for your 50th wedding anniversary? He says, I'm going to go to Italy to pick her up. <laughs> then finally... And this one, we're going to hear a pin drop. Stay sexually active in your marriage. Stay sexually active. If you want to avoid adultery, stay active. Now, I'm not going to tell you the frequency. Paul says, do not deprive one another in marriage. Now, if you're older and that's not an issue in your marriage and neither of you have a desire for that, that's fine. That's between you and your partner. But don't deprive each other in marriage. And often that happens. And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? He says, Satan will come in and tempt. Now, for some of you, schedule it. I'm being serious. There is a place for spontaneity and there's a place to schedule because if you're so busy, you know what? Make a point to be physically active with one another. That's not dirty. It's not bad. God created sex. It's a beautiful thing. And I'll tell you what, it bonds couples together. And so don't neglect it. Don't use it as a weapon against one another, but stay sexually active and that will help guard against adultery. All right, let's look at the eighth commandment. He says this in verse 15, you shall not what? Steal. In the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, I love the word. You know what the word is? Klepto. We get the word klepto from this. You've heard of the term klepto what? Maniac. It's taking what belongs to someone else, which by the way implies ownership of property. In fact, this is sort of a subtle, a subtle reinforcement of capitalism. I don't think the Bible teaches communism. I don't think the Bible teaches what we're trying to push in our culture today. You see, by the fact that you say don't steal implies private ownership of property. And again, this is a big problem in our culture today. In fact, I remember when I was a young boy, I had a penchant for stealing. I don't know why, but I remember... I would walk close to one of the grocery stores in Miami. It was called Winn-Dixie. Ever heard of Winn-Dixie? Well, there was a Winn-Dixie nearby, and I would walk to Winn-Dixie, and they had one of these huge containers with Hot Wheel cars, and I would just help myself to them and walk out, five-finger discount. And I remember when I was in Sears one time, I stole a flashlight, one of those little ones, and when I got home, my parents found it, and they said, where did you get this? And I said, well, I took it from Sears. And they said, come on, get in the car. And so, you know, back in the days when, you know, morals were reinforced, I had to go and I had to give it back to Sears. I had to fess up to it. See, stealing is a part of our culture. There's a lot of things, a lot of ways, I should say, that we violate this particular commandment. Uh, one way is swindlers. Haven't we seen a lot of this today with these Ponzi schemes? In fact, Bernie Madoff just died recently. Embezzling money. People call it 
the salami principle. You ever heard of the salami principle? I read about it recently where this uh, rent-a-car company, what they were doing was they were taking little bits of, of, of amounts of money from the people that would rent their cars. They would add on like two or three dollars. It was so insignificant that the person would not even recognize it in their bill. It's called the salami principle because you just slice off just a little bit at a time. And what happens is the compound interest of that, you end up getting a lot of money. Well, this particular company got caught and they got nailed for it. Illegal kickbacks, extortion, thieves who rob, loot, and plunder people's houses or cars. We feel violated when people commit this. Stealing on our jobs by not working when we say we've worked eight hours, getting paid, using company money for personal enrichment, lying on our income tax is another way we do this. How about this one, violating copy law, copyright laws or stealing someone's work and claiming it as your own? Or how about this one, the redistribution of wealth that people earn? Do you realize that is a form of stealing? That's why I'm not for this socialism. Because you're punishing people that work hard and you're taking their money and giving it to everybody else and that is a form of theft or stealing people and enslaving them. I remember years ago I was eating at a grocery store in New Jersey. It's called ShopRite. They have all different kinds. And ShopRite, they had a place in the back where they had a food bar. I mean, it was really good. They had a salad bar. and So I got a salad and I ate and... Usually what they do is when you purchase your salad, in the container they would take a sticker and they would put it on there saying that you bought the salad or whatever you bought. It was proof that you got it. And so I ate the salad and then I threw it in the garbage can and I walked out. And as soon as I walked up, I walked out, a guy came up to me like this and I thought, oh gosh, he's going to witness to me. <laughs> and he said, excuse me, he goes, um, did you pay for that salad? And I was looking at him going, what do you care? He says, did you pay for that salad? I said, yeah. He said, uh, well, we went and grabbed it, and it didn't have the sticker on it. He says, I'm a police officer. I said, uh, yeah, I paid for the salad. He says, but there was no sticker on it. I said, the worker didn't put a sticker on it. He said, well, I said, look, that's not my problem. She, put, she didn't put the sticker on. And he was all right with it, but he said this. He says, you know what? We have a problem with this where people are going into the store, they're eating these lunches, and then they're just walking out. He says, this is a major problem, theft. It's rampant in our culture. The Bible calls us to be honest, and the Bible calls us not to steal. Well, then there's the ninth commandment. In verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We do this in two ways. Number one, we do it formally in a court of law or in a trial. This is called perjury. This is called slander. This is when you lie about somebody and you get them in trouble. The Bible condemns that. Proverbs chapter 6 says that God hates when you and I bear false witness against our neighbors. In fact, Jesus had this happen to him in his trial. They falsely accused him. And listen, when we testify, we're to be honest with the truth. That's why they have you take your hand, put it on a Bible. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Because they don't want you to commit perjury, bear false witness against somebody. Why? God hates that because it can ruin someone's life. I remember when I was in high school, one of my good friends, I was going to his house and his brother struggled with drug use. And when I pulled up, his brother was outside and there was another car outside. And evidently, his brother was having a spat with this guy. I don't know if a drug deal went bad or what. But his brother, and I'm sitting there watching this, his brother starts screaming at the other guy in the car, and then his brother, my, my friend's brother, pulls out a bat. And I thought, oh gosh, this is going to get ugly. And he takes the bat, and he smashes the guy's windshield, and is screaming at him every expletive. And I thought, I got to get out of here. And so thankfully, no death happened. And so it ended up getting taken to court. And my best friend's father asked me to go and testify. And he said, basically in more or less words, would you be willing to spin the truth of what you saw? And I said, no, if you ask me to go, 
I'm going to say, I'm going to say it exactly how I saw it. I'm not going to bear false witness. See, we could do that in a legal, formal sense, but listen, we do this informally today in our culture. Listen carefully. Our media is destroying people's lives because they misrepresent people, they bear false witness against people, and it destroys people. It's a form of lying. And you know how you and I do it? When we don't have all the facts and we say, so-and-so said this, so-and-so believes this, do you realize that's a form of bearing false witness? Because we may be misrepresenting other people. In fact, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you know what you and I are doing? We are bearing false witness to other people. We're saying God raised Jesus from the dead, and if God didn't raise Jesus from the dead, we're lying and we're bearing false witness. And so we got to be very careful. We're all guilty of this. Well, so-and-so believes this, and -and so-and-so said this. Are you sure that's what they believe? No, I'm not sure, but I think that's what they said. And listen, sometimes we can get people into trouble and we can slander them by bearing false witness and not accurately representing them. Well, we get to the final commandment tonight, and that is this. In verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, this commandment goes on the inside. Obviously, some of the others do as well, like killing, we're not to be angry, adultery, we're not to lust, but coveting is on the inside because it deals with our thoughts, it deals with our desires. It's based on needs, and it's based on greeds. What is coveting? It's when you want what someone else has, and you're willing to hurt that other person if necessary in order to obtain it. In fact, look at this picture up on the screen. You'll notice this story right here. This is a man by the name of King Ahab. And one day, King Ahab noticed this uh, vineyard here. And it belonged to this guy named Naboth. Naboth was a godly man. And Ahab went to Naboth and he said, hey, I want to buy your vineyard. And Naboth said, well, look, I don't want to sell it because it's in my family and and I want to bequeath it. So he didn't want to sell it. Well, King Ahab, being the wimp that he was, goes home and he's whining and moping about it. And his wicked wife, Jezebel, says, what are you crying about and moping about? He said, well, I wanted Naboth's vineyard and he wouldn't give it to me. She says, listen, buddy. She goes, you're the king. She goes, if you want the vineyard, take it. He wanted it. He coveted it. And so you know what they did? They took Naboth out and they stoned him to death and killed him at the behest of Jezebel. You see, that is coveting. And we're all guilty of this. In fact, Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 7, he realized that he was a sinner because the law exposed his covetousness. We want this. We want that. We want someone else's spouse. We want this particular success. Whatever it is, we can all be guilty of coveting. In fact, one person said, gambling falls under this command. Some people say, well, gambling's not talked about in the Bible. It is. And here's what this person said in reference to the 10th commandment exposing gambling. They said, quote, in gambling, the only way for you to win that money is for someone else to lose that money. You are coveting the possession of another, which you hope they will lose so that you will gain, end quote. And so these are the 10 commandments. Let's look at them. What are the Ten Commandments that he gives that we've looked at? The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, don't make an idol to replace God. The third commandment, don't take God's name in vain. The fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. The sixth commandment, you shall not murder. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. The Ninth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the Tenth Commandment, you shall not, what? Covet. And so, it says in verse 18, as we close, all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Now, you got to understand, they're camped around Mount Sinai, and remember, God told them they had three days of preparation. There was this anticipation. God says, wash your clothes, don't have sexual relations, 
and get yourself ready because I'm going to show up on the mountain. And God shows up in a theophany. You have lightning, you have thunder, you have this smoke. And all of a sudden, after three days, the people hear the sound of a loud trumpet. By the way, it doesn't say who sounded that trumpet. And I was reading today that many people believe that was the first trumpet of God. God was the one who sounded that loud trumpet, and then you have the last trumpet, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. And so the people hear this noise, they hear like an earthquake, and they go out of their tents, and they peel it back, and they look at the mountain, and they see the the fire, the flashes of lightning, the thunder. Listen, the people freaked out, and here's what they said. You and I would have freaked out as well. They said to Moses in verse 19, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will what? Die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. He acted as their mediator, just as Jesus acts as our mediator in between us and God. He says, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. In other words, God created this this sound and the effects in order to instill fear in the people so that they would reverence God. So when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and he brought them down, the people would be open to obey. God is teaching them. There is a healthy fear of God, by the way. As Christians, we don't have to fear God in a cowering sense because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, but make no mistake about it, the Bible says the fear of the Lord causes us to turn away from evil. So the people stood at a distance at verse 21 while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. And so what's the conclusion here? What do we learn from the Ten Commandments? Let me give you two things real quickly as we close. Number one... Because I can't keep God's commandments, it drives me to Christ for salvation and forgiveness. And I think we all know this. A lot of people in our culture feel like they can keep the commandments. You'll notice the picture up here. Next slide. You'll notice here, man is constantly trying to keep the commandments in order to get to God, but the Bible makes it very clear that the commandments are designed not to save us, but to drive us in our need for God. Because why? In the next slide, you'll notice that Jesus Christ is the mediator. He is the one who kept all the commandments. Therefore, we are driven to God when we realize that we are insufficient to keep the commandments of God. And there's one other principle that I think from the Ten Commandments we learn, and that is this. We are called to keep the commandments still in the power of God. The commandments still apply today, except don't keep the Sabbath. Look what Paul says in Romans 8. He says, and so he, that is Christ, condemns sin in the flesh in order, listen to this, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met, what? In us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the what? The spirit. You see, God still expects you and I to keep the Ten Commandments. We can't do it in our own strength. Now listen, we don't keep them in order to get saved but I keep them because I am saved, and I want to please God, and I want to honor God. And so let's all of us, in the power of the Spirit, fulfill these commandments. Let's pray. Father, thank you this evening for reminding us of these commandments that many of us were probably raised with. Many of us were taught in our our homes the commandments. We were taught in church. And yet, Father, we realize that it's so important to rehash them because We all violate them, sometimes willfully and sometimes unintentionally. Lord, I thank you that the commandments drive us to you, not only for forgiveness, but also, Lord, for salvation. And Father, I pray that you would work in this country, God. We have casted the commandments aside. And Father, this is seen by many of our courthouses and Many of our state capitals, there's, there's these arguments about removing the commandments because of separation of church and state. Lord, it's just a reflection of the fact that we have become a secular society, and we don't want your commandments to rule over us. And so, God, we ask you to forgive us, we ask you to cleanse us, and we ask, Lord God, that you would awaken this nation again to your commandments.
and that people would see that because we have violated them, we are seeing the consequences in our society. We ask this in your name.